Hello, welcome to our next session. In this session we're going to talk about the agreement trust matrix and how important this is in our leadership philosophy and our leadership practice itself. What I have found interesting over the years is how often we talk about teamwork, developing a team, putting a team together, personal conflicts, interpersonal conflicts, all of this human relation element in leadership is fundamental to leading practically. We can talk about theory all you want, and we should. We should talk about research all you want, and we should. But there are some elements here that are very practical and very pragmatic that we can't underestimate relative to this leadership process, and specifically the practice of leadership. I want to talk to us about the two areas of leadership, especially the human dynamic of the people around us and who's on our team or on the bus, if you might know, be familiar with that common phrase, everybody on the bus and, and, and the different kinds of team metaphors you might have, and there's no I in team, all of those kinds of things, are all related to this agreement trust matrix. Now Peter Block is the person who first used this agreement trust matrix and it's been now modified several times since then. So this is Peter Block's agreement trust matrix, but it's really important for us to understand the element of this team dynamic that we're on and human relations in general. Everybody we know and everybody we work with, we, we measure the value or value the decision or rate the quality of our relationship based on these two factors, agreement, I'm sorry, agreement and trust. There we go, agreement and trust. This idea of agreement and trust is huge. Agreement by let's define these terms for you. So agreement is basically do we think alike? Do we have similar experiences, similar passions, similar likes, similar dislikes? People are in agreement when they think the same way or have the same thoughts. In other words, typically it's, it's measured by do we like the same things, do the same things, do we hate the same things? When those things are in common, we typically are said to have agreement. Oh, we both like this band, we both like this type of food, we both like this type of music, or, or this type of vacation, whatever it is, uh, and it brings us, we see something in common, and we agree to relate together over this area that we have in common. Again, that thing in common can be something we like or something we hate. Trust, then, is about believing someone has your best interest in mind. Now what's very important about that understanding of trust is that it has nothing to do with longevity of time. We typically say things like, well, you have to earn my trust, or I won't give you my trust until a certain period of time. And that's not necessarily true. Everyone basically right off the bat decides if they're gonna trust someone or not. And they base that decision over their first initial impressions over if they believe this person has my best interest in mind or this person uh, uh, has my back, as it were, to use that kind of metaphor, that they would support me if it came to it. That's what trust is. Now, you can lose trust over time, but typically we give trust very early on in a relationship or a meeting despite what we typically think about uh, trust being a consequence of a long-term kind of a thing. So when we define trust as those two, and this is very important, again, agreement is something that we have in common, and, and how strong is that attachment to that common thing? Uh, because I might have a, 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 a strong draw for a, spurt, a certain sports team, uh, and a less draw for a certain type of food, uh, and this strong draw to my sports team might put me in connection with other people who have a similar passion for this. Even though I might find other people with this other food that I like, it might not be as strong of a draw. So the strength of that passion for that thing in common is, is important in this agreement. And then trust again is do you genuinely believe that this other person or group or organization has my best interest in mind or at least some of my interest in mind? Understanding these two things, and based on those two definitions, then we get four categories. In other words, everybody we relate to, and every organization we relate to, we relate to at least at these two levels, how much we agree with them and how much we trust them. So we can have then four options. We can have 
low agreement and high trust. We can have high agreement and low trust. We can have high agreement and high trust and low agreement and low trust. Okay, and this is the matrix. So if you look at this matrix here that we have up here on the screen behind me, you'll, you can see how that looks. So what I want to point out to you is these different quadrants. These are the four different quadrants of the agreement trust matrix. And I would like to mention that I talk about this in my book on contextual intelligence by Palgrave Macmillan that's coming out with a new edition in 2017. There's a whole section on this in that book. The high trust, low agreement. Now we have names for these. I, let me back up. We have names for these. The first one, for people who we have a high degree of trust and high agreement, you can see there in the red, it says allies or friends. Okay, people who we have a high degree of trust and high level of agreement with, we, um, these are people that give energy to our vision. They are on our side. We agree with them. We believe they have our best interest in mind. We believe that they uh, have our back. We believe that they, they, they uh, think the same way we do, therefore have similar experiences and interpret their experiences similarly. Okay, these are people who are our allies. We look to them to fuel our vision. When, when we need to get something done, when we need to create team and create energy and create momentum towards something, we always go to our allies for that. The trouble with allies is that they think like you do. They act like you do. So they're not really giving you a full, true representation of what's going on. It was General George S. Patton from World War II, a famous United States general, who said, if all of us are thinking the same way, then only one of us are necessary or is necessary. And that's a very poignant example of what can go wrong when you bring and surround yourself with only allies. The other thing that's interesting about allies is that we spend a lot of our time and effort looking for allies. We want people around us who think like we do and we believe have our best interest in mind for us. So we naturally try to look for them. But the trouble is when we look for these types of people and find them, maintaining them is very difficult. Uh, sociologists and psychologists will tell you that having a large amount of friends or allies is very difficult to balance because of the emotional energy that it takes to maintain that type of relationship. So for example, just think about the people who are closest to you, the people who you spend your time with, your spouse, your children, your siblings, you know, uh, etc. It takes a lot of time, emotional energy, a lot of effort to maintain the quality of relationship that you like to have with those people. Because of that, we can't have too many of those at any one time in our lives. Uh, professionals and experts tell us only between three and five at any given time. So this idea that we have 20 friends, close good friends, 20 allies who are on our side is kind of nonsensical. It really doesn't exist. When in a matter of fact, there's only a small handful of people who are actually there. And when we start building it by just by nature of the difficulty, other people fall off. And it's, it's kind of inappropriate to walk around thinking, well, I've got 20 friends or 30 friends or Facebook, like I've got 50,000 Facebook friends or whatever, or 5,000, you know, it's kind of, kind of silly. But this is the high trust agreement. And we spend so much of our time looking for allies. And I'm here to tell you, on our teams and from a leadership perspective, it's not always the best use of energy, the best use of resources and our effort to look for and develop allies all the time. On the other side of the spectrum are adversaries. These are people who we have low agreement with and no trust. We don't have any similar experiences. We don't think the same way. We don't like the same thing. We don't even hate the same thing. Uh, we don't, and I don't believe you have my best interest in mind. These are adversaries. These people resist us and we resist them in all fairness um, and point out our failures, okay? So we don't like to have these people around. In fact, these are the people who we actually deal with the most effectively, ironically, because of the fact that we don't like them, they don't like us, we actually are very amicable with each other. You don't like me, I don't like you, you go your way and do your thing, I'll go my way, do my thing, and we don't ever have to talk. And usually that works out well. And the interesting thing is, excuse me, 
the interesting thing is when you are forced to interact with these people, you typically are very professional, very courteous. It's a short meeting, it's a very efficient meeting because you don't want to be in any bother, in their presence any longer than you have to. So you interact and you part your ways and go your way. These are our adversaries. And we need to be aware of them because again, they're gonna point out our failures. What's interesting then are these next two uh, corners. And this is where the fun part of team dynamic and team development really takes place. You will notice that we have high trust and low agreement. So these are people who we trust. Now think about this, high trust, but low agreement. We know from research and from what the experts say that these are the people who we need the most of in our lives. The people who make us better are the people who we trust but don't agree with. This is why diversity is such an important issue in organizational development. Because the idea is, now I, don't, I am a, also a big proponent of this doesn't work this way in practicality, but theoretically, the idea of diversity is people who have a whole bunch of different ways of thinking or different agreements will challenge our assumptions and they, as long as we believe we're on the same team. So we spend time developing diverse teams in the hope that we bring opponents into our lives, people who we trust but don't agree with. What ends up happening, by the way, there's research that indicates what ends up happening in organizations we end up hiring from a diversity perspective a lot of people who are different than us physically different genders different skin colors different cultures different ethnicities they're different in that regard but also the same in how we think um, in my own research for example we've discovered that organizations have a high cultural diversity and a low i'm sorry a, a low cultural diversity, but a high multicultural element. Um, what that means is I've seen teams, I've worked with teams where they have a very multicultural team, different genders, different ethnicities, the executive board is, is made up right, the staff, the senior vice presidents, et cetera, meet all the diversity requirements from, a, from an ethnic multicultural standpoint. But when you talk to each individual, um, independently, you'll find that they all think the same way. They all, had, they all went to, for example, to Ivy League universities, and they all have, came from affluent families, and they, there's so much more in common that they have that's not in common that it becomes an irony. And that's what happens in traditional cultural diversity um, programs and initiatives. So it's very important, though, ever, that we develop true opponents. In other words, people who we trust, but who think completely differently. Now to develop the opponents versus a just diverse team takes intention, takes purpose. We have to really look after those, those types of, of connections. Are the people we're hiring, are the people who are on our teams actually different than us in philosophy, in their leadership philosophy? In session two, we talked about our leadership philosophy. Do people we have on our teams have a different leadership philosophy, different experiences, different backgrounds, not just do they look different and, and, and that's it, and think otherwise the same way. It's opponents that add the value and richness to our lives. Uh, as a little humorous joke, a lot of times when I do this seminar, I'll put in that category instead of opponents, my wife, somebody who I trust but don't agree with. Think of your own significant relationships, whatever those might be, and understand that the people who challenge you, the people who ask you to think differently than you normally would think, um, can help you or, or not help you. It depends on where they fall in this. Think of an adversary, for example, someone who you don't trust and don't agree with, and they told you something that challenged your assumptions, that challenged you, or told you you were a jerk. Guess what? When my enemy tells me I'm a jerk, my response to them is, so what? So are you. You're a jerk too. And you don't give it any credence because there's no trust there. There's no agreement there. But when someone you trust tells you you're being a jerk and they think differently than you do, now you're faced with a decision to make. 
you can either blow them off or but because you trust them because you believe they have your best interest in mind you're like all right what did i do you may not like it but you still go back and consider your actions as a consequence of what they pointed out when my enemy tells me i'm being a jerk so what when my wife tells me i'm being a jerk or a close colleague who I've developed a relationship with tells me I'm being a jerk. I'm like, all right, I'm sorry. What did I do? Help me understand this. And I actually use that information to change who I am and to make different decisions in the future. This is the value of opponents. Without opponents, we can't make the best decisions possible. So we have to have opponents in our lives. We have to have people who we trust but don't agree with. This is so hard for us because we don't want to find people who we don't agree with. Based on first impressions, it defaults to agreement. So we typically do, we replace agreement as the higher, um, higher uh, virtue here as opposed to trust and we shouldn't. So this leaves then now, let's move on to the next one. This next one is the most fun to talk about, the most interesting somebody who we have high agreement with, but low trust. Okay, so in other words, we, we, have, we like the same thing, we have a similar passion, whatever, with similar hate. Uh, we have agreement, but I don't trust you. I don't believe you have my best interest in mind. A lot of times we find ourselves in relationships like this with our organizations where we work. Well, we're agreement, they need work, I can provide work, they have money to pay, I need money to live on. So we have something in agreement, we have a common contract, we agree that I can do this job and you need this job done, so let's do it, but we don't trust them. In other words, I don't believe they have my best interest in mind. They're not looking out for me, they're looking out for the organization. And the second they find someone who will do what I do for less money, I'm out the door, or something like that. So this is the example of someone who we agree with but wouldn't trust. What's interesting about this is these are the people who we have most of in our lives. And this is fundamental to understand when you're talking about teamwork. And matter of fact, failure to understand the agreement trust matrix is one of the major obstacles to practicing contextual intelligence, which I've been talking about in the previous two sessions. This fourth category, the term that we use is bedfellows. Okay, these are people, again, who we agree with, but don't trust. We want the same thing, but we don't know each other. Hence the phrase bedfellows. It is provocative on purpose. It's a one night stand metaphor. We want the same thing, but don't know each other. The issue with bedfellows is as soon as whatever brought you together, that common passion, that common hatred, whatever it was that you had in common that brought you together, when that goes away or is solved or resolved, the relationship typically goes away. Now, when you look at these four categories, you'll see that allies are the people who we look for the most, but actually can handle the least. Opponents are the people who we need the most, but actually look for the least. Bed adversaries are easy, like I said. We just ignore them and they just come and go as they, as they are. So we don't really even address them. But then bedfellows, on the other hand, the last one, bedfellows are the ones who we have the most of, but are less productive for us, okay? So this idea of high agreement and low trust is fundamental. The issue here with, with bedfellows is when, when, we, when the circle of life and organizational life happens and people come and go, uh, we develop friendships, or what we say are friendships, based on agreement. Well, because we had these things in common. We went to university together. We liked the same baseball team. We liked the same cricket team, whatever it might be. Um, we follow, um, we go to the same church, you know, whatever it might be. We belong to the same club, social club. Uh, the second I stop going to the social club, the second the team loses the game, the second the game's over, whatever, the relationship quality decreases significantly. A lot of the times we feel heartbroken by that because we think we've lost a friend. We have college and high school friends. We say, well, we'll be friends forever. We don't realize that we weren't truly allies or opponents. We were only bedfellows. And you know that after the fact because, hey, I haven't kept up with this person anymore because the thing that held us in common is no longer there. 
when we understand that they were bedfellows and not allies or opponents, it A, makes that easier to understand and also clarifies for us from an organizational perspective exactly what we need from people and what people need from us. Now, what's great about this is this goes both ways. You can use this agreement trust matrix to evaluate the people on your team. Not everybody on your team is an ally or an opponent. Some are bedfellows. You have to uncover, as the manager, as the leader, you have to uncover their motivation for being on your team. Like I said, statistically speaking, most of them are going to be bedfellows, even though you think you're the best leader ever. Okay? You have to find out their motivation. The other thing this does is it, and the more valuable thing this does, is to help you understand who you are to other people. So don't just make this list and start listing people's names of, well, this person's an ally, this person's a bedfellow, this person's an opponent, here's another ally, here's another opponent. You know, don't do that. You can do that, but don't do that first. What you need to do first is think about who these people are and then ask yourself, why do I relate to them? Am I a bedfellow to them? Am I an opponent to them? Am I an ally to them? The idea would be to get yourself to the top of the circle there, top of the matrix, to be an opponent or ally, which means you need to do certain things to garner trust. That thing is you need to convince them that you have their best interest in mind. That's leadership. When the people around you believe, genuinely believe that you have their best interest in mind, you can say anything to them and they'll be okay. They can say anything to you and you'll be okay. This is, what, this is the difference between management and leadership. Managers live at the bottom of the circle. Leaders live at the top of the circle. And know that there's transitions between and people will move around. Back to my wife as an example, or anybody's wife, not just mine. But, you know, we understand there are times when my wife switches all those categories. Sometimes she's an adversary. I don't, I don't trust her on a particular issue because she hasn't said anything, or I don't. Sometimes she's an opponent. Most of the time she's in that opponent category. I trust her, but I don't agree with her. And she challenges my thinking. She makes me better because I trust her, but I don't always agree. Sometimes she's an ally. There are times, and maybe more than I just let on, but there are times when we are in 100% agreement about what to do and we have total trust there. There are other times when I want something from her and she doesn't know if it's gonna pan out for her or not, if what I want to do is gonna benefit her. So we're bedfellows in certain situations and people will switch from time to time based on the context. This is why, again, I reference contextual intelligence is so important. You have to discern where the people are in the four quadrants, where you are in the four quadrants relative to how they perceive you, and then how they change from quadrant to quadrant depending on the context. That's contextual intelligence, and it all ties very closely and intricately to leadership and how well you lead and how well you manage. So take a minute and just look at that screen, look at these things if you haven't been doing it already, and look at this agreement trust matrix and begin to classify and clarify how you fit relative to other people. How do people change their roles? Do you know certain people in multiple settings? It's very likely and possible that Jimmy, your next door neighbor, is your neighbor, but he's also a manager at work in a different department and so you have different relationships and at work you know uh, he's an opponent but at home as a neighbor he's an ally or a bedfellow or something like that think about that and the roles people play how and when they change and then what causes them to change what has shifted in the environment what has shifted in the context to cause them to change these are questions that you have to come to terms with if you want to be a successful leader, a leader who influences people, a leader who manages interpersonal relationships and handles change well and builds collaboration. Thank you.